Welcome to session four of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. This section is a crash course in statistical inference. It's really hard to do that and statistical inference is a huge topic that really takes uh, multiple full semester courses. But I hope that this uh, gives you a very useful overview and covers uh, several aspects of statistical inference that usually are not covered in a basic or introductory course. Um, and remember that there is a topic on datamethods.org devoted to discussion of each section of BBR and I expect this particular section will generate a lot of discussion so please go to datamethods.org and look for BBR session 4 uh, and add to the discussion and ask your questions there. So we start with an overview of statistical inference. What are the different modes of statistical inference? <clears throat> there is hypothesis testing that most people are somewhat familiar with. Uh, and then there is the less familiar mode of statistical inference, which is assessing relative support for hypotheses. Uh, this might involve likelihood ratios in the likelihood school of inference. And um, Bayes factors, if you're Bayesian. Uh, you can also think of relative support of different hypotheses, such as the hypothesis that the mean blood pressure is 100 versus 120, uh, is also being a, a method of assessing relative model fit. So you might have a model that specifies the mean as 100 and another model that specifies the mean as 120. We're usually not that specific but you could see which of those two models better fits the data and gauge the relative fit uh, in a way that's very similar to likelihood ratios. Then there's estimation. Uh, most people are familiar with point estimation, estimating a mean or a mean difference or a proportion, uh, but estimation also includes interval estimation um, such as using confidence intervals, and that's often more appropriate than hypothesis testing and may give you much more information. We'll cover that shortly. And then another mode of inference, and this list is really not exhaustive, is calculating the Bayesian probability of an effect in the right direction. So, uh, does a drug improve something compared to another drug? So is it moving efficacy in the right direction? Uh, so that's really, to me, more directly relevant to decision making and it's more actionable. Now contrast uh, statistical inference where, where you might be doing hypothesis testing or trying to draw various conclusions. Contrast that with decision making. So a decision making, which could also be called uh, uh, acting or, or making an action um, is really um, acting as if something is true. So you're saying the evidence is strong enough in a certain direction that it's in our best interest to act as if something's true, whether or not it's actually true. Now hypothesis testing uh, in the minds of many statisticians has been greatly overused and I haven't actually seen that many examples in my career where hypothesis testing was by far the most uh, reasonable way to proceed. I think of hypothesis testing as being more relevant when you're trying to show that something exists. So if you're trying to show that ESP or extrasensory perception exists, uh, you might have a hypothesis um, that you're trying to reject. Uh, you might be trying to show that people can guess something better than chance. Um, and so to show the existence of ESP would be quite a breakthrough. Um, but for other types of questions, the idea of uh, acting as if you're trying to show something exists is, is an indirect way to do the inference we really want. Uh, now most of the hypothesis tests uh, mechanism that you see in statistics involves testing against a single point. We're going to have a null hypothesis that the treatment effect is zero. 
It doesn't have to be a single point. You can have interval hypotheses, but the vast majority are single point null hypotheses. Now, these hypotheses place asymmetric importance on special values, such as um, you might have a lot of importance on an exactly zero treatment effect. Now, what does it mean to not reject a hypothesis? Um, it really doesn't mean very much, actually. Uh, what does it mean to reject a hypothesis with a statistical test? Well, it really means more than, than you think it means. Because uh, when you're formulating a statistical test, you, you have some sort of a model for the underlying process. And the model has a lot of different aspects, including the thing of interest, like a difference in means, and the variability and various other things, such as distribution assumptions like normality or a bell-shaped curve for the raw data. And so when you reject a null hypothesis, what might make you reject the null hypothesis could be any aspect of the model. It could be that the variance in the two groups really isn't the same, or the data really do not come from a normal distribution. Uh, you hope that the model is good enough so that the only thing that you might reject the model for would be your hypothesis of interest, such as equality of two probabilities or two means. But you might reject it for many different reasons. Um, now, even when all the assumptions of a data model are satisfied, when the hypothesis involves a single point, such as a zero effect, the alternative hypothesis is going to be the complement of that point, and that's really an infinite set. And so, what have you really learned about a specific alternative when the alternative is the set of everything except the number zero? Uh, so, what have you learned about the the possibility that a treatment lowers a blood pressure by 10 when you're testing a null hypothesis that it's zero and giving zero a lot of special inference, uh, importance. Now statistical testing, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, involves using a model for the data. Now with parametric statistical tests, the models are very specific and pretty restrictive. There are non-parametric tests uh, that don't seem to have models, but to really act optimally, in other words, to have optimum power, uh, and sometimes to also give you the right p-values, model uh, non-parametric tests have some model assumptions, it's just they don't have a distributional assumption. And then there's a third type of test, which is a permutation test, which doesn't make a distribution assumption, but it still needs some sort of model, even in a weak sense, of needing to know what statistic to calculate the permutation distribution of. Are you going to be looking at differences in means? And if you have a heavy tail distribution, the mean might not be the best way to summarize the central tendency. So permutation tests are still going to assume something because they have to choose a summary statistic to uh, permute over uh, re-randomizations of the data. Uh, now later uh, in the course we're covering a non-parametric test first because uh, for historical reasons and they're also very useful for sample size estimation. We have a little bit more trouble doing sample size calculations for non-parametric uh, tests for example. And then occasionally one has prior information that the raw data behaves in a certain way, um, such as following a normal distribution. Um, and with large effects, you might get quite significant results in very small samples with a parametric test, even with as few as, say, four animals, uh, that you would not be able to achieve with a non-parametric test. Um, I think one way to say that is if you're able to show strong statistical significance with an N of 4, you're really uh, placing a lot of confidence in the assumptions that the test is making, and you're getting a lot of power from making those assumptions, but the results may be very non-robust uh, with some departures from the assumptions used in those tests. Uh, now. 
parametric tests are also useful uh, once you do them in a Bayesian way, as we will do later, uh, because with Bayesian parametric tests, you can make fewer assumptions about the data model. Uh, and we will explain more what that means. Nonparametric methods will be covered later. So back to the data model, uh, we need to assume something about how the data were generated. And so what does a statistical model have in it? Well, it has parameters or unknown uh, values that are of interest, such as the average blood pressure for a certain type of patient or for a uh, difference in mean blood pressure. And then there's auxiliary parameters uh, for other variables that are not the ones of major interest. These may be adjustment variables or confounders. And then there's parameters for variability, such as between subject variability. And then the model may have a distributional assumption. So the Gaussian or normal distribution or bell-shaped curve is one assumption that's made quite frequently, uh, and that's part of the model. If you're using a non-parametric or semi-parametric approach, which I think has a lot of value, you're not assuming a specific distribution, but you are assuming connections between distributions. So you might be assuming that the shape of the distribution for males is the same shape of distribution for females in a certain sense. And so uh, non-parametric and semi-parametric methods assume what's called a link function, which is the function that makes that connection between distributions of different types of subjects, even though it doesn't assume the distribution for any one type of subject. So if a model is longitudinal, it will have another component, which it might be a correlation pattern for multiple measurements within a subject. And then if you have messy data, such as data that might be censored or truncated, or you might have uh, a lower limit of detection, uh, you would have to make various assumptions about those complexities to be able to model those. And then there may be other components of a model depending on your particular application. So let's look at one of the most common models considered. Uh, this is a model that assumes you don't have any adjustment variables or covariates or confounders. Uh, so this is a model that might be used in a randomized trial where you have uh, very homogeneous patients, you don't need covariates, and you're trying to make an assessment of whether treatment B is better than treatment A in terms of the mean response. So our response variable is capital Y. Uh, that could be the mean blood pressure, or sorry, could be the raw blood pressure for a given uh, person. And then the blood pressure is a function of some constants that we wished we knew, but we don't, mu zero and delta. Mu zero is the unknown mean for treatment A that generated the data, generated capital Y. So mu zero is the mean for treatment A. Delta is the difference in means between treatment B and treatment A. So that is the unknown difference in means that generated our data in addition to uh, mu zero and the error term epsilon. Now this notation here in brackets, that's just a shorthand sort of clean way to uh, use an indicator variable or a dummy variable. So when treatment B is in effect, so a subject is, is getting treatment B, this would be a 1, and if the subject had treatment A, this would be a 0. So multiplying 0 by delta means you're just stuck with mu 0 as your mean uh, for group A, but the mean for group B is going to be mu 0 plus delta. Now you have your error term, um, and that's the final component in this particular model that generated our data. So we have two constants, and then we have something that's not constant because it can be different for every subject. So this is the irreducible error. This is the unaccountable subject-to-subject -subject variation that we wished we could get rid of, but we can't. It's also called biologic variability, and let's suppose it has a variance of sigma squared. 
So what is the primary goal of using this model and making statistical inference related to the model? Our goal is to uncover the hidden value of delta, the difference in means. We're more interested in that difference than we are in the mean for group A, which is mu zero. Uncover the hidden value of delta that generated our data set in the presence of the noise epsilon. Now when sigma squared is high, that's the variance of the residuals or the errors. Um, you get a larger absolute error and it's harder to uncover delta, delta, which is our signal. So epsilon represents the noise, delta represents the signal. The higher the variance, the error variance or residual variance, that's called the, the larger the absolute errors, the harder it is to uncover signal from the noise. Now just think about what would happen if all the epsilons were zero uh, for all the subjects. That means there's no uncertainties and you would directly observe delta because you would directly observe the two means and those means would really be precise estimates of the underlying or population mean. So if you could directly observe delta and mu zero because there's no uncertainties because the noise is zero you don't need any statistical inference. You already have the answer. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is uncover the parameters in the presence of noise and uh, just doing this thought experiment about what would happen if epsilon were zero is useful for understanding what's going on. Now if you take your model as the basis of your data generating mechanism, it's an assumption you hope it's a reasonable assumption, a reasonable fit to the data. And then you can make a hypothesis test on the basis of the model. Um, and then um, you might reject a straw man hypothesis test. And that would say that some aspect of the model is in doubt. As I mentioned before, that aspect may not be the one you think it is. It might be something about the distribution of epsilon, these random errors. Uh, say not being a normal distribution, it might be something about equal variance assumption. So we had one sigma squared in our model, we might have needed a different sigma squared for treatment A and treatment B. So testing a hypothesis that seems to only be about the parameter of interest may actually bring along some baggage with it. Now there's a very common error in statistical analysis, which is using a two-stage testing procedure and not adjusting for it being a two-stage procedure. So what do we mean by that? Um, you might be uh, looking at normality of the raw data and using that to select whether to use a non-parametric test or a parametric test. So um, you're assuming a lot of things to be able to use a two-stage procedure you're assuming that the data has enough information that allows you to lead to the right conclusion. Does it tell you about equal variance in the two groups? Uh, does it tell you about normality? And when you use a two-stage procedure, because that might result in you either doing, say, a Wilcoxon non-parametric test or a t-test, you're actually operating, uh, altering the operating characteristics of the final test. And then you're making a mistake of uh, not realizing that non-parametric tests work great anyway. So if you had a normal distribution and you used a Wilcoxon test, you lose about 5% relative efficiency. So it's like uh, throwing away 5% of your data. And that's not really much of a loss. I, I view that 5% as an insurance premium against non-normality. Uh, if you had a non-normal distribution, the Wilcoxon test can be arbitrarily more powerful than the t-test. Uh, so this two-stage procedure uh, might be testing for normality, decide whether to use the test. Um, and the two-stage test uh, assumes a lot of things. It assumes that the power for testing for normality is close to one so that you have a very low um, type 2 error for our sample size and often our sample sizes are not really big enough to discern whether the data follow a normal distribution or not. And, and then 
if the test rejects the null hypothesis that the data are normally distributed, is the magnitude of normality really worth bothering about? It may be if the sample size is really large, you'll detect a really trivial amount of non-normality. So you might have too much power in a certain sense. And then you're modifying um, the type 1 error of the overall testing procedure. So you're assuming by doing an initial look at the data and then doing a final test selection on the basis of the initial look, you're, you're assuming that you can ignore all of these things. And that's really not the case. And you're also implicitly assuming that non-parametric tests are less efficient than parametric tests. And that's really very, very seldom true. Usually the reverse is the case. Um, so you'd be making four assumptions to use a two-stage procedure. And if you really thought that the data might not have a normal distribution, you should just use a non-parametric test straight away and not bother with any assessment of normality. The non-parametric test will work just fine. Now, um, when we get into Bayesian uh, t-tests, for example, you'll see that there is an advantage of the Bayesian approach. It can be more honest in a certain sense and provide the right amount of, of caution. So you might have a Bayesian t-test that allows for uncertainty about whether the variances in groups A and B are the same, and it allows uncertainty about the normality uh, assumption. So you might have a non-normality parameter in the model. You might have a variance ratio parameter with a prior distribution that favors equal variance, but it doesn't force them to be equal. And you can still get proper inference about the difference in means, and your uncertainty interval or credible interval will be wider because you did not know the data came from a, a normal distribution. There was uncertainty about that. So there's uh, uncertainty about normality, there's uncertainty about equal variances, and those uncertainties will translate to a little bit wider uh, credible intervals um, that take into account that you, there's some things you don't know. And we have a little bit of an aside because this is a point where even introductory statistics courses tend to spend a good deal of time teaching students the central limit theorem, and I really uh, have a lot of difficulty figuring that out, especially in the age of modern uh, high-capacity computing where you can use bootstrapping and other things that don't, don't really care about normality assumptions. But what is this central limit theorem? Well, it makes various assumptions, so it assumes the observations are independent and have the same distribution, and they have a finite variance and then the, uh, the central limit theorem assumes that you can increase the sample size without limit and the result is uh, if those things hold the limiting distribution of the sample mean is normal no matter what the data distribution was. So in the limit as n goes to infinity the distribution of the sample mean, the average of the n observations gets more and more bell-shaped uh, but the question is, what is the speed of that, and does it get to be normally distributed fast enough so that you can use the central limit theorem as an approximation? I think there's a lot of hidden assumptions in the way the central limit theorem is applied, and it's used to justify parametric tests because you'll see even really, really knowledgeable statisticians say, well, um, as n gets bigger, the parametric test is going to behave because our summary statistics like means and regression coefficients are going to behave really well. Um, and so they use that to say we don't really need non-parametric methods. We can just use parametric methods because they're actually robust. And that's really missing several points. Uh, the central limit theorem and people often use the t-distribution in conjunction are really much less helpful for computing confidence intervals and p-values than it seems. So one of the subtle issues with the central li limit theorem is it sort of assumes that the variance is known. And if you have a continuous outcome variable where you need a variance, the variance is very seldom known. 
We really have to estimate the variance while we're estimating the mean to use the central limit theorem. Now because we have to estimate the variance, we often estimate it using the square of the standard deviation and the standard deviation may be a very inappropriate summary of dispersion. So in effect the central limit theorem because you have to normalize by the standard deviation that you have to estimate from the data, it really is assuming that standard deviation is a good measure of variability or dispersion. And that is really often not the case. So for example, if you have data from a log normal distribution so that you should have calculated the standard deviation after taking logs, but you didn't take logs, uh, that standard deviation is going to be very, very wild. Another problem with standard deviations is if you have an asymmetric distribution, the unlike the case with a symmetric distribution like the normal distribution where the standard deviation is statistically independent of the mean, which allows you to derive the t-distribution, uh, with an asymmetric distribution the uh, standard deviation is not a good measure of dispersion and it is not independent of the mean. So the T ratio does not behave correctly. And then um, what's maybe a little easier to understand is the sample size needed for the central limit theorem to be accurate enough for our use uh, is really um, not known because we don't really know the underlying data distribution. Um, and so here's an example, uh, and we'll get to this more in just a moment. We have a log normal distribution, and we can show with a very simple simulation that the central limit theorem is not accurate for getting a confidence interval, even with a sample size of 50,000 subjects. So if it, can, if it doesn't work well enough for 50,000 subjects, just imagine uh, the sample sizes, with the sample sizes we often see in practice, it would be much worse. Um, now, even if the central limit theorem provides protection against type 1 error, in other words, if it gives you p-values that are fairly accurate, uh, if your distribution, say, is not too heavy tail and not too asymmetric, it really gives you no comfort at all with regard to statistical power. This is a very common mistake made by very experienced statisticians that they put all their eggs in the type 1 error basket when they're invoking the central limit theorem and they forget that it has nothing to do with giving you an acceptable type 2 error or having good power. So if you should have taken the log of y but you analyze y on the original raw data scale you can have a really horrendous type 2 error uh, if you use the central limit theorem in doing your inference. So here's the um, simulation where we're simulating data from a log normal distribution. We actually do it here by taking uh, data from uh, simulating from a normal distribution and anti-logging that. So this normal distribution before anti-logging uh, has a uh, mean of zero and a standard deviation of 1.65 and um, this is the formula in R for computing the mean on the uh, original data scale um, so that is the mean of a log normal distribution but let's just do 50,000 simulations and let's look at how often a confidence interval that used the central limit theorem actually has the right coverage uh, with regard to both endpoints. Uh, as an aside, a very common mistake made in doing simulations like this is to look at the overall coverage and you might get um, an overall 95% confidence interval that covers 95% of the time the true mean on the original scale, uh, but it it has a tail area of 0 on the left and 0.05 on the right. So both confidence limits would be wrong, but you're right on the average. So it's not good enough to look at the average. So we actually count how often uh, the lower confidence interval computed from the central limit theorem is above the true mean 
and then how often is the upper confidence limit below the true mean. And so when you do that over 50,000 uh, experiments, um, I'm sorry, 5,000 experiments, each with a sample size of 50,000, we see that these two tail areas are not close enough to 0 0.025, even with 50,000 samples. So the the non-coverage probability on the left is 0.018 when it should have been 0.025 and the non-coverage on the right is 0.04 when it should have been 0.025. So that's really um, not accurate enough. You, we want both confidence limits to be accurate, not just the central uh, coverage in the middle to be 0.95. There's a nice discussion about this example with a lot more input from others on stats.stackexchange.com at this URL. So now we get into hypotheses and we first of all uh, talk about something general which is uh, scientific hypotheses versus questions. And so scientific questions are usually stated with a direction or with regard to some expected effect, not with respect to a null effect. So we often create a null hypothesis as sort of a straw man, and it's not always a natural process to go through. Uh, many, many scientific questions involve estimating a quantity of interest. So that quantity of interest might be a difference in means um, or, or something more simple. Uh, for example, um, we might ask a question, does the risk of death increase when serum triglyceride increases? Uh, to what extent is mechanism X responsible for regulation of physiologic parameter Y? What is the average decrease in blood pressure when the dose of a drug goes from 0 to 10 to 20 milligrams per day? So those are examples of scientific questions. And then we get into statistical hypotheses which are, as I said, can be a straw man, not always natural. Uh, so a hypothesis is a statement to be judged that's of the form some population value is equal to a specified constant. Uh, the constant's often zero when you're talking about differences, but it doesn't have to be. And so we might uh, say we want to know, we want to find evidence against uh, the mean being 120 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure. Or we might have a null hypothesis that the difference in mean blood pressure between two groups is zero. Or a null hypothesis that the correlation between wealth and religiosity is exactly zero. So as I mentioned, a null hypothesis can be a hypothesis of no effect, uh, or it can be uh, hypothesizing any point of any constant, and then there were interval and uh, one-sided hypotheses also that we're not covering very much here. Uh, so a null hypothesis could be that the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads is a half, and you might be hoping to disprove the null hypothesis. Then you would have an alternative hypothesis, which is um, the complement of the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis was this one up here, the alternative is that the population mean is not 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, so you can have one-sided hypotheses such as a one-tailed test, and then um, you have hypotheses that are inequalities in a certain direction. Most tests are two-sided, not necessarily for good reasons, but it's sort of by convention. Um, and that uh, two-sided hypothesis gives rise to a two-tailed test. And then the alternative hypothesis involves values away from the hypothesized value in either direction. Okay, now we get into another section, uh, which is a brief overview of the different branches of statistics. First of all, there's classical statistics, which is also called frequentist or sampling statistics. 
it really emphasizes hypothesis testing and in my view overemphasizes it and in hypothesis testing with classical or frequentist statistics we assume a null hypothesis is true and try to amass evidence that casts doubt on that assumption. We're conceiving of data as one of many data sets that might have happened and we consider the process by which the sample arose. So the way the sampling is done is not usually talked about in say medical papers uh, but the sampling is very important in the frequentist world. Uh, inference is based on long-run operating characteristics not about direct evidence from the sample at hand. So we might be interested in uh, having a small probability of making an assertion of an effect if there is no effect. Um, and that probability is really a long-run probability, not a probability associated with any one experiment because the frequentist method does not allow for that. Uh, in terms of confidence intervals, which we'll cover um, uh, towards the end of this session, we calculate the proportion of times that varying confidence intervals over replicates of the experiment will cover the true unknown parameter. Uh, so again, that's a long-term, long-run operating characteristic, and it doesn't make any statement about um, the data set we have in front of us. It just has long-term properties that make us hope it works well for the data in front of us. There's no statement about the chance that the current confidence interval covers the true parameter. So we see if the data are consistent with the null hypothesis. Are the data extreme or unlikely if the null hypothesis is really true? So we engage in a kind of proof by contradiction. Of course, it's not really a, a logical proof. And so we're operating on the supposition that if assuming the null hypothesis is true leads to results that are bizarre or unlikely to have been observed, we're casting doubt on the premise or the null hypothesis. So the evidence might be summarized through a single statistic capturing a certain tendency in the data, such as the sample mean. And then in the frequentist hypothesis testing world, we look at the probability of getting a statistic as or more extreme than the calculated one from our one sample. What's the chance of getting results as or more impressive than ours if, in reality, the mechanism generating their data, there was nothing to the effect? The null hypothesis was true. Uh, so the p-value is the probability of getting a statistic more extreme than the one that we obtain if the null hypothesis is true. Uh, note that I said more extreme because the probability of getting results as extreme is zero if you're dealing with a continuous distribution. If a statistic has a low probability of being more extreme than the one we observed, uh, if the null hypothesis is true, we say that we have acquired data that are very improbable in other words, we've witnessed a low probability event. Now, William Briggs has a very nice essay, uh, Everything Wrong with P-Values Under One Roof, that's very interesting reading. And he has some pretty convincing way of concluding uh, that Fisher made a logic error in his original thinking about the action you take in interpreting a p-value. And so Fisher said that belief in a null hypothesis as an accurate representation of the population sampled is confronted by a logical disjunction. Either the null hypothesis is false or the p-value has attained by chance an exceptionally low value. Most people don't really go and decode that from a purely logical standpoint but William Briggs did exactly that, and he showed that this sort of logical uh, disjunction uh, reduces to, um, in a very formal way, to uh, from from saying uh, we either either the null hypothesis is true, uh, or we've observed a small p-value. Uh, when you write that out and work through the logic. 
you really don't have anything except we observed a small p-value. Um, the this, this small p-value doesn't have any fully logical implication about the hypothesis. And so uh, read this, um, this statement by Briggs, see if you agree. Um, but I think the logic of saying that either the null hypothesis is true or we've witnessed a very unusual event is actually a lot more problematic than we tend to, uh, tend to uh, admit. If we ignore that and just plunge ahead, um, there's some, another description here of a p-value that I think is really a, a perfect uh, definition. Uh, and many authors have called the p-value a measure of surprise. I think that's a good notion. Uh, Maxwell said a p-value is a measure of how embarrassing the data are to the null hypothesis. I think that's, that's really a good way to say it. So if the evidence mounts against the null hypothesis, we might reject the null hypothesis. Um, a failure to reject the null hypothesis does not imply that we have gathered evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Uh, that error is called the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence error, and much has been written about that. There are many reasons for studies to not be impressive. So if you could uh, say that we have evidence in favor of the null hypothesis because the p-value is large. Uh, there, if you want to make that conclusion, there's no reason to have a sample size greater than two because with two subjects you can calculate a p-value and you'll get a large p-value and then if you're following this logic you could conclude uh, that, th that we have evidence to support no difference but a sample of size two is not going to do that. So there's a lot of reasons why a p-value is large. P-values ignore clinical significance and is fraught with a multiplicity mess. So there's so much controversy about multiplicity, how to deal with it, and in the frequentist world, there's no principled recipe for how multiplicity should be handled. You hear about Bonferroni inequality, multiplication inequality, Shafe, Tukey, Fisher, and all these other methods there's no principle that really says which one of those we should be using. They're all fairly arbitrary. Uh, now, why do multiplicity problems arise? Uh, well, they can arise because you're analyzing multiple subgroups of subjects um, or because you're analyzing multiple variables. Uh, but multiplicity arises because the type 1 error is fixed at a number that's greater than zero. We'll talk more about that when we get to likelihood inference uh, shortly. Uh, but if you, if you allow the type 1 error to always be positive, uh, no matter how large the sample size gets, uh, that actually causes a multiplicity problem. Um, and another big cause of multiplicity is transposed conditionals. Uh, we'll make more sense of that in later sessions. Uh, but p-values and type 1 errors are actually reversing the order in which information becomes available. And when you analyze something out of order of how information becomes available, which is a transposed conditional, it is that backwards time ordering of information that's used in the hypothesis test that actually creates a multiplicity problem. So, um, you might be asking multiple questions and in frequentist statistics there's a preoccupation with preserving the type 1 error and so uh, if you believe in the type 1 error not being allowed to increase as you ask more questions that means the evidence that you demand about one question is changed according, according to whether uh, other questions are asked regardless of the answers of those questions. There's much, much more to multiplicity, uh, but this is just a very brief mention. Now, classical parametric statistics assumes the data arise from a certain distribution, such as the Gaussian distribution. Non-parametric statistics do not assume a data distribution. They, it generally looks at ranks rather than raw values. 
but you can do hypothesis tests with either non-parametric or parametric statistics. Now what about Bayesian statistics in this other school of thought? One of the others. It considers the sample data, not how it arose from a sequence of samples. It considers the data generating mechanism for this sample. And this sample may be a one-time sample that no one could ever replicate in another experiment. It could be that only for a brief moment in time was a certain treatment available. Um, and we have a natural experiment that we could try to make a conclusion. Um, but it's a one-time sample. Uh, Bayesian statistics, when you do uh, inference using a Bayesian posterior distribution, computes the probability that a clinically interesting statement is true. So you might calculate the probability that a new drug lowers mean systolic blood pressure by at least 5 millimeters of mercury, given what we observed in the data. And instead of trying to amass evidence against a single hypothesized effect size, Bayes tries to uncover the hidden parameter generating the data aside from the noise. In other words, for example, your treatment effect. So Bayes tries to uncover the evidence uh, about the parameter uh, no matter what its value. And so Bayes provides evidence for all possible values of an unknown parameter. This is such an amazingly important statement that I'm going to repeat it. Bayesian inference provides evidence for all possible values of an unknown parameter, not just evidence against a single value such as zero in a null hypothesis. So uh, in my mind, the Bayesian approach is more natural and direct, but it does require more work. Because it respects the forward flow of time or information, there's no need for, no, nor availability of methods for correcting for multiplicity if you're using Bayes. The evidence about one question is not tilted by whether other questions are asked. And you can formally incorporate knowledge from other studies as well as skepticism uh, from a tough audience you're trying to convince. So if you really want to convince a certain audience, you might say, okay, what is your skeptical prior distribution that you would use about this particular treatment effect and you use that skeptical prior uh, and if you provide uh, a very high posterior probability of efficacy even though you use the skeptical prior that group of skeptics would have to be convinced. So Bayesian methods are catching on fairly rapidly. It's, they've been around since Thomas Bayes around 240 years ago um, and the availability of software is a major reason Bayes is starting to catch up because it does have a very uh, big computational demand. So we've overviewed traditional or frequentist statistical inference. We've given a very brief uh, overview of Bayesian methods, although not how to do either one. And then the third uh, branch of statistics that we'll talk about is likelihood inference. Likelihood inference considers the sample data, not how it arose, so it's, it's like Bayesian in that sense. And it's a little bit akin to the Bayesian method in some other ways, uh, but without having a prior distribution. Uh, the interval estimates that you get out of the likelihood approach is based on relative likelihoods. Uh, so these are called likelihood support intervals. These do not have a probability associated with them but it's really based on essentially relative information. Now one interesting thing about using likelihood ratios as a test statistic is using the likelihood branch of statistics and using likelihood ratios, let's say you might have a likelihood ratio for um, a treatment having no effect versus a treatment having a certain large effect. Uh, the, the likelihood approach has the type 1 errors and type 2 errors both going to zero as the sample size goes to infinity. Whereas with the frequentness approach, the type 1 error never shrinks as n goes to infinity. So no matter how many hundreds of thousands of subjects you uh, study, we're going to still allow a type 1 error of, say, 0.05. 
Now to allow a type 1 error of 0.05 with a sample size of 100,000 subjects uh, means that you're going to allow yourself to be impressed by a very small but non-zero difference. Uh, and so since the alpha does not go to zero, we're going to have this problem with uh, statistical significance diverging from clinical significance. So by allowing the type 1 error to go to zero, you're greatly reducing problems with multiplicities. A disadvantage of the likelihood branch of statistics is it doesn't deal well with complex assertions. Um, multiple endpoints and the like. So you might have an assertion that either the treatment reduces mortality by any amount or it reduces blood pressure by at least 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, that's an assertion that would be very very difficult to assess with likelihood inference or with frequentist approach. Uh, likelihood like the frequentist approach also does not allow the use of external information as Bayes' methods allows through the use of prior distributions. Now both Bayesian and likelihood inference use the likelihood principle and frequentist inference does not. Frequentist inference makes use of the sampling um, distribution and the sampling distribution uses the sample space and what might have happened with alternative samples than the one that you actually observe. Now the likelihood of principle says that all of the evidence in a sample that's relevant to the model parameters is in the likelihood function. So if we obtained a sample uh, by stopping a study early for efficacy, frequentist approaches would need to go to a lot of trouble to account for the sample space and this early stopping from multiple looks, whereas frequent, uh, Bayesian and likelihood approaches would take the data at the time that you stopped and, and just assume that the data are self-contained and will get completely valid inference. Uh, so this, this analogy here um, may or may not help you uh, to think about what happens when you think in a forward math approach like Bayes does, which is more of a predictive and decision-making approach versus thinking about making an assumption about something that you don't know and then working backwards to see what data might have arisen. So it's like this uh, example. If I'm in Nashville, uh, let's say I don't know where I am, but I've, if I'm in Nashville, what fraction of the routes that I might have traveled to here, wherever I am, involve the southern route that I took. So there's many paths to get where we are and frequentists have to consider all possible relevant paths. Uh, Bayesian and likelihood inference states it differently. Where am I now? That involves an assessment of current evidence about my location. Asking how did I get here? In other words, how did the data arise? Involves multiplicity issues that answering the simple simpler question, where am I now, does not. So let's consider a sequentially monitored randomized experiment. Uh, Bayesians and likelihoodists can make infinitely many assessments of efficacy with no penalty whatsoever. And on the other hand, frequentists have to worry because they're interested in preserving the type 1 error and the type 1 error will get bigger as you make more looks at the data. So the more looks you make at the data, the more opportunities you have for data to be extreme. A p-value is a probability of extreme data. Bayesian approach is making probabilities about the parameters, not about the data. So since Bayes is calculating probabilities about mu or delta or whatever your parameter of interest, uh, that is not concerned with uh, looking at the data more frequently and having more extreme data because Bayes is not calculating a probability of data. So with a frequentist world, since it has to look at the probability of getting data more extreme than what we observe, uh, let's suppose you're at the first interim analysis of this, of this sequential study. 
Uh, I know I'm going to make later assessments of efficacy, so I need to discount the current assessment and be more conservative or I will spend all of my alpha already. Uh, and then by the time you get to the last scheduled look, you have to say, I've made four previous assessments, even though none of them mattered. In other words, I didn't make any decision or change course because of those assessments. I spent alpha along the way. So I need to discount the current assessment and be more conservative. There's a story that Jim Berger of Duke University tells of uh, talking to an investigator who has some data and is seeking help from the statistician to analyze the data and submit a paper. And uh, they used a frequentist approach and got a p-value of say 0.04. Um, and then um, the principal investigator says, oh, I would really like to submit this. And then the statistician remembers to ask, well, were there uh, any other looks uh, scheduled? Uh, and then the investigator says, um, well, this was the first of two looks and there is more data to be accrued and we have um, another final analysis scheduled in our protocol. So the statistician says, well, you'll have to uh, take a penalty um, and when you take a penalty for the fact that this is the first of two analyses, um, the p-value 0.04 will not be sustained. And then the reaction of the investigator was, oh, I'm going to cancel the study at this point. I'm not going to get any more data. Uh, the study's over and um, I'm going to write it up and submit it. So you see what sort of problems you get into uh, when you're talking about data extremes and what might have happened. Now in uh, the rest of this uh, chapter and going forward, you'll see more treatment of parametric methods and uh, classical methods and non-parametric methods than Bayesian methods, just because um, it, the traditional approaches are easier to do and the software is more abundant. But over time, we'll be adding more Bayesian uh, examples. So now we get into um, errors in hypothesis testing uh, p-values. So you can attempt to reject a formal hypothesis or you can just uh, compute a p-value. The type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true and alpha is the probability of making that kind of error. We typically set the type 1 error alpha at 0.05 for very very weak reasons. Uh, so alpha is the probability of insert, asserting an effect when it doesn't exist. The probability of asserting an effect when the effect is truly zero. So the type 1 error is an assertion error. It's an assertion probability or a false alarm probability very much like 1 minus specificity in diagnostic testing. A very common error is to attribute to type 1 error something that it's not able to do. You'll hear um, people at FDA and pharmaceutical companies say, oh, we need to preserve the type 1 error uh, because it's a chance of making a mistake. Well, it's, it's not that at all. So type 1 error is not a false positive probability. So what is a false positive probability? A false positive probability is a probability that the effect is zero, the drug doesn't work, given an assertion that it is effective. So the alpha or type 1 error is based on an assumption that the effect is zero. So since alpha assumes the effect is zero, it cannot give you a probability that the effect is zero. That probability is already one in the calculation of type 1 error. So type 1 error is not a false positive probability what is type 2 error? That's our second type of error in hypothesis testing in the classical sense. That's failing to reject no, a null hypothesis when it's truly false. The probability of that is usually called beta. So this 2 by 2 table will help you uh, see uh, the meanings of type 1 and type 2 errors. 
So you have a decision as you reject the null hypothesis or you do not reject the null hypothesis. We do not say accept the null hypothesis, but we do not reject it. And then we have the true state of the null hypothesis. Is it really true or is it really false? So depending on this, uh, which cell you're in, you'll have a correct uh, analysis or a correct determination or conclusion, or you'll have an incorrect, uh, and the probability of those are alpha and beta. The power is just one minus beta. So the power is the probability of picking up an alternative hypothesis. It is the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis when it's really false. Now within the frequentist framework, there's two schools of thought. Uh, one is the Neyman Pearson school that believes that type 1 error should be preset uh, and so that, so that you can make binary decisions of reject fail to reject. And the other school of thought is Fisher's, that he believed you should compute a p-value and quote the result of that in your report or publication, use that in your decision about whether to uh, follow this up with a uh, replication study. Fisher's approach is much more popular because it's less dichotomous uh, than the Neyman Pearson approach. Now the simplest definition of the alpha uh, in how people usually do statistical tests uh, is they, uh, they pick um, a, an alpha level, like they pick a 0.05 cutoff for a p-value, and then if you use a test in that fashion, the simplest definition of alpha is the probability that the p-value is less than it. So the probability that the p-value is less than alpha is equal to alpha. So a p-value is something you can compute without speaking of errors. It's a probability of observing a statistic more extreme than the one you observed if the null hypothesis is true. In other words, if the population from which the sample was randomly chosen had the characteristics posited in the null hypothesis, for the p-value to have the usual meaning, the data model has to be correct. Just as with Bayesian inference, when you're calculating a posterior probability of something, um, your data model has to be correct for the posterior probability to be correct. Now, what are some of the problems with type 1 error? Well, it's really, uh, you could argue that it's not really an error. It's, it's the chance of making an assertion. An error by most people who are not statisticians, they would probably say an error is being wrong in asserting an effect. Uh, the type 1 error is the probability of asserting the effect. It's not the probability of being wrong about the assertion. It's the probability of triggering the assertion. So type 1 error is an effect assertion probability. So frequentist design uh, studies to present to pre preserve type 1 error, but the type 1 error is not the probability of making a mistake and concluding that an effect is present. So to say that you have a very conservative procedure that when you make 10 data looks it preserves the overall type 1 error, um, if you really are putting all of your eggs in the basket of the assertion probability, that's a good thing to do, but if you're trying to uh, capture probabilities of making a mistake about concluding that a drug is effective, then that's not so good. So as I mentioned earlier, when alpha is set to a constant, the probability of an asserting that effect when there is no effect never decreases even as n goes to infinity. That's that statistical versus clinical significance problem again. Um, this is a good thing to remember anytime you are putting perhaps too much emphasis on alpha. Alpha is a pre-study concept. Uh, once your data are collected, it doesn't apply the same. Uh, alpha is not a function of your data. It's, it's a function of tendencies for data to be extreme over an infinite series of experiments. 
it is not depending on any observed data. Alpha increases if you give your data more chances to be extreme, which is the multiplicity problem in classical statistics. Alpha doesn't increase because of chances you give hypotheses to be false. Uh, Bayesian and likelihood approaches do not look at sampling, uh, and so that's why they don't have those same problems with multiplicity. Uh, now, um, what is it that we really want? We want to calculate the probability of making a mistake in asserting an effect given the data. If you calculate the Bayesian probability of efficacy of a treatment, let's say it's a probability that theta is greater than zero for some parameter theta, uh, that's the probability that the drug works in the right direction. What is one minus that? That's a probability that drug doesn't work. It either has no effect or it actually makes patients worse. So the probability of making a mistake in asserting an effect given the data is one minus the Bayesian posterior probability. It's not anything that you get from frequentist uh, methods. Now p-values have given people fits and p-values are some of the most misinterpreted and misused things that we have. Um, and there is a paper by Sander Greenland et al. Uh, that is really an amazing paper that catalogs uh, just about all of the misinterpretations of p-values and I highly recommend that paper to you. Uh, so we'll cover some of these problems. Um, so a very common misinterpretation is that the p-value is the probability that the test hypothesis is true. For example, if a test of the null hypothesis gave p of 0.01, the null hypothesis has only a 1% chance of being true. If instead it gave a p-value 0.4, the null hypothesis has a 40% chance of being true. That is false. Uh, p-value is not a hypothesis probability, um, and this is a complete misinterpretation of what a p-value means. The p-value for the null hypothesis is the probability that chance alone produced the observed association. For example, if the p-value for the null hypothesis is 0 0.8, 0.8, there's an 8% chance that chance alone produced the association. That is exactly wrong. That's just a variation of the first. To say that chance produced the observed association is logically equivalent to asserting that every assumption used to compute the p-value is correct including the null hypothesis. And so this is a backwards claim. The p-value is a probability computed assuming chance was operating alone, so it cannot tell you anything about the probability that chance was operating. A significant result, uh, let's say it's a small p-value, means that the test hypothesis is false or should be rejected. That's not the case. A non-significant one means the test hypothesis is true or should be accepted. That's not the case. A large p-value is evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. No. A large p-value can come from a large variance or a small sample size in addition to coming from a small effect. A null hypothesis p-value greater than 0.05 means that no effect was observed or that absence of an effect was shown or demonstrated. Not the case. Statistical significance indicates a scientifically or substantively important relation has been detected. No. So just go down the list and read all of these. Um, I think these are just wonderful ways of stating what p-values do not do for you and it will help you avoid uh, mistakes in interpreting p-values. So uh, our last uh, section of this session is a brief overview of interval estimation. So we're going to talk about interval estimation for traditional frequentist methods and then for Bayesian methods. So let's talk about frequentist confidence intervals. A 1 minus alpha two-sided confidence interval is an interval computed so that if the experiment was repeated capital N times 
one would expect n times 1 minus alpha of the recomputed varying intervals to contain the unknown quantity of interest. Um, so that is an exact definition of a confidence interval. There, it's not stating what the model assumptions were. That's sort of taken for granted. Uh, but it's telling you about the long-term operating characteristics of these different intervals that you would compute for each of your samples. So the coverage probability of 1 minus alpha, let's say alpha is 0.05, um, we would expect uh, 95 of 100 intervals so computed, these intervals would, would all disagree with each other in their endpoints, 95% of them would contain the unknown value, whatever it is. And there is an equivalent way to define a confidence interval, the set of all unknown parameter values that if you made a null hypothesis that the value was equal to that value, you would not reject that null hypothesis at the alpha level with a two-sided test. So there's an equivalence between a two-sided test and a two-sided confidence interval. The set of all values of the population parameter such that if you made a null hypothesis that the true value was that parameter value, you would not reject it at the alpha level. That gives you this set of values that is the 1 minus alpha two-sided confidence interval. Sandra Greenland likes to call confidence intervals compatibility intervals, and I do think that is a better terminology. So what are some of the pros of confidence intervals? Well, the p-value can be computed from the confidence interval, but you, you cannot compute the confidence limits from the p-value. So the confidence limits have information that the p-value doesn't have. It has more information. Confidence intervals do not allow the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence error. So we know that p-values can be large because the n was small or because sigma squared was large. And um, you'll get a large p-value with, with an n of 2 just about no matter what. Uh, but you can't conclude that you've, you've brought any evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. When you calculate the confidence interval for a small n, the confidence interval will be very wide and it gives you a rational sense of uncertainty. You really haven't learned very much if the confidence interval is wide. So if a confidence interval includes both a large positive benefit and a large detriment of a treatment, that shows that we really don't know very much. So if you look at the medical literature and probably most other fields, you see a lot of papers published where the conclusion was the treatment did not benefit patients. And that, in that same paper, you'll see often the confidence interval includes a major benefit and a major harm. In other words, you don't know anything except the money was spent. So a large p-value means nothing more than get more data. But the wide confidence interval would keep you uh, pretty much out of trouble. What are some of the cons to confidence intervals or compatibility intervals? Well, they have only a long-run interpretation over many experiments. They really do not provide a probability statement about whether a single interval includes the true population value. Uh, in the frequentist world, the probability that the parameter is in a given interval is either 0 or 1. There's not really uh, talk of probabilities. Um, now, confidence intervals and the width of a confidence interval is often uh, taken as a measure of precision of an estimate, and there are some problems with that interpretation. Um, and then a, a fairly subtle problem here is the experiment experimenter controls the long-run inclusion probability, 1 minus alpha, uh, that's the coverage probability, and gets the interval. So you're, you're setting the coverage probability in the long run of multiple experiments, and then you solve for interval endpoints using your data that gives you the confidence limits. But the investigator who would like to know 
what is the probability of an interval that they specify. They might want to know what's, what's the probability that the blood pressure reduction is between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, you, don't, you don't get to do that with a confidence interval. It's always working in only one direction. It's very difficult to make confidence intervals incorporate known uncertainties. So if you were uncertain about whether to use a normal distribution, you were uncertain about the equal variance assumption, um, and if you, let's say you either just plunged ahead and assumed normality and equal variance in a t-test or you did a two-stage test as I described earlier, your confidence intervals will actually not have the coverage that you claim. So you may claim 95% coverage, might really be 85 or 90% coverage, the intervals will be too narrow. They'll be over-optimistic by not taking those uncertainties into account. Now let's contrast that with Bayesian credible intervals. A credible interval has the interpretation that most researchers seek when they compute confidence intervals. So a 1 minus alpha credible interval is an interval A to B computed under a certain prior distribution so that the probability that the unknown parameter is between A and B, given the data and the prior, is 1 minus alpha. So you're actually making a probability statement um, and you're saying something like the probability is 0.95 that the uh, mean blood pressure is between uh, 113 and 127. So what are some of the pros of Bayesian credible intervals? Well, they pertain to the single current data set and they don't provide just uh, long run operating characteristics that mean you're right on the average. Uh, they provide a true probability statement uh, even if the experiment could never be repeated. Um, tell by irony, I think at the FDA uh, may have been the one that told me the analogy here is um, if you were uh, a judge in a courtroom and you prided yourself as uh, as having only a 5% false conviction rate over all of the defendants that comes before you, uh, you would probably be disbarred. So that is a long run operating characteristic for that court. The judge is not charged with that. The judge is, is charged with making the best possible decision for a given defendant. So the judge wants to um, optimize uh, her probability that the defendant is guilty. It's not going to be interested in long run operating characteristic over multiple defendants in a courtroom. What is the con of the credible interval? Um, you must specify a prior distribution. Um, oh, and I, I mentioned, I uh, forgot to mention two other pros, is that it's symmetric with the posterior probabilities of pre-chosen limits. So a researcher might specify A and B, so they might want to say, what's the probability of mean blood pressures between 110 and 130? and then compute whatever probability it is that the unknown mean blood pressure is in that interval. So you can work backwards with a Bayesian approach, but not with a frequentist approach. And the credible interval can take into account all sorts of uncertainties, such as non-normality, uh, that make it wider, and it, it'll be correct in being wider. Uh, and then the con, as I mentioned, you must specify uh, a prior uh, distribution. So we'll be getting into specific statistical tests and we'll be contrasting uh, like Bayesian t-tests with the traditional t-test. Uh, so look forward to talking about that uh, in the next session.